Welcome to Virology Live. This is session number 14. Today we're going to talk about adaptive immunity. Just to sum up uh, what we have talked about so far this week about host defenses, last time we discussed intrinsic defenses, those that are always present in the uninfected cell. These include defenses such as apoptosis, autophagy, RNA silencing, antiviral proteins, and we discussed the innate immune system, which is induced by infection, but typically has no memory and occurs very rapidly within minutes to hours. Today, we're going to talk about the adaptive immune system, which is not only tailored to the pathogen, which is different from intrinsic and innate defenses being tailored, and we'll see what that means today, but it has memory, and that's the key. That's why it's a beautiful defense. So last time we ended with this image, the uh, communication between the innate and adaptive systems. We have infection, in this case, at an epithelial barrier of some kind, uh, viruses entering these epithelial cells, reproducing in them. Their presence is sensed by the innate immune system. The response of the cells to sensing the virus is the production of cytokines and chemokines. The cytokines include interferons, which in turn induce antiviral proteins to try and limit virus reproduction. But the cytokines and chemokines also attract the sentinels the dendritic cells in the macrophages to the infected area, they will produce cytokines on their own, but they will also pick up pieces of dead and dying cells. These cells will become activated. They will enter the lymph node where they will interact with the T cell. The T cell will determine if the uh, Pro the, the antigens that the dendritic cells have picked up are foreign or not. Uh, and if they are foreign, then a, an adaptive response is initiated. And that includes the production of antibodies and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So in the lymph node, as we'll see, there are both B and T cells, uh, and eventually those will be making the antibodies and cytotoxic T cells and other things as we'll see today. So that's an overview of what we're going to talk about. But first, let's talk about the cells that are the players today. These words we use, leukocytes and lymphocytes. Well, leukocyte is a general term for a white blood cell. And that can include lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and macrophages. These are all different kinds of blood cells that have different, um, different functions. Um, we don't touch on many of them. Mostly we talk about lymphocytes and monocytes. So they're all leukocytes. And lymphocytes are a subset. These include T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells, which have in common variable antigen detecting cell surface receptors. Uh, what is that? Well, <laughs> T cells have the T cell receptor which is tailored to a specific uh, peptide, as you'll see, or antigen. Uh, so do B cells. B cells have a, a receptor on their surface, which is the antibody molecule, actually. And NK cells also have a receptor. So that's what a lymphocyte is, a subset of leukocytes. Leukocytes, white blood cells. So you'll see the term used a lot. Just don't, don't use leukocytes and lymphocytes interchangeably because lymphocytes are simply a subset, okay? So that is... Uh, that, those are the players today. And just to show you how all of this develops, uh, in the bone marrow, an amazing place, <laughs> which we don't think about much, but you know, your, your bones are filled with cells, and uh, they do all sorts of things, including serving as the precursor for all of these cells that we've talked about and more. So we have in our bone marrow what's called a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell. A stem cell, of course, means... It can give rise to other cells, often differentiated. And the multipotential stem cell can 
differentiate into two lineages, which are shown here. They can differentiate into the myeloid cells, and they are all produced from a common myeloid progenitor, which in turn differentiates into red blood cells, um, basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes and other cells that we haven't talked about, right? So that's the myeloid. So when we talk about myeloid lineages, these are the cells that we're talking about. But then we have the lymphoid progenitor, and as you might guess, it's the precursor to lymphocytes. And that progenitor gives rise to natural killer cells, T cells, and B cells, which eventually can become plasma cells, which are the cells that produce antibodies, secrete antibodies. Now, these multipotential hematopoietic stem cells are self-renewing. That's what this arrow means. They can divide and make more of themselves, which is good. And uh, when you have an infection, often cytokines enter the bone marrow from the circulation and stimulate the differentiation of the stem cell into other cells that are needed to combat the infection. So you, as you can see here, this all happens in the bone marrow, and then these cells leave and go into the circulation. So T cells and B cells originally arise in the bone marrow, uh, and then um, the T cells go to the thymus. This is all early in development. Uh, they go to the thymus for further maturation, and then the B and T cells go to the lymph nodes where they hang out. Some of them circulate, of course, but there are a lot of them in the lymph nodes that can be mobilized when we have an infection. So we also talked last time about how um, the, the dendritic cells become activated and this plays a big role today, uh, the innate instruction of adaptive immunity. It's continuing on this theme. So here's a immature dendritic cell. And as we, we said last time, these cells can take up dead and dying cell pieces that are produced by, say, apoptosis. Uh, they are phagocytic. So immature dendritic cells, macrophages, can take up dead and, dead and dying cells. And the purpose of that is to see whether there are any foreign proteins or other antigens in them. And how is that done? Well, here it's shown uh, for a protein. Uh, these proteins that are taken up are digested by the proteasome of the cell uh, and moved into endosomes where they're loaded. You know, the peptide is loaded. It's kind of a jargon, but uh, and it, it basically, that's the term that we use. But what it means is the peptide, which is shown as an arrow, um, an orange rectangle here, is attached to uh, the MHC class two molecule, major histocompatibility molecule. These are cell surface proteins. Um, there are two types, type two, class two and class one. Class two are primarily found on uh, dendritic cells on the surface. Here, they're in the endosome of the immature, immature dendritic cells, macrophages and B lymphocytes. And in contrast, MHC1 is on nearly all cells. And we'll look at the function of MHC1 today. But MHC2 takes these uh, peptides, and uh, as the, the dendritic cell becomes activated, the MHC2 moves to the plasma membrane. It displays the peptides, and eventually it will, it will interact with a lymph, uh, T cell in the lymph node. These dendritic cells move to the lymph node, so they're activated and matured by uh, this, these phagocytic processes, but also by cytokines they pick up from the infected cells, they may also sense viral proteins, which will turn on the production of cytokines, as we showed earlier. So they have uh, cytokine receptors. They have toll-like receptors and cytosolic helicases. They're just loaded. These are just amazing cells. Um, so they, they uh, become activated, they mature, and they go into the lymph node, where they then interact with what are called naive T cells. Naive simply means that they haven't encountered an antigen yet. They do have a T cell receptor, and you have many, many, many T, <laughs> T lymphocytes in your lymph nodes uh, and circulating, all with different T cell receptors that can just about recognize any peptide out there. Huge numbers, and they don't recognize self. Those have been eliminated during fetal development uh, by apoptosis, as we said later. So the T cell receptor uh, interacts with the peptide. Uh, there are other uh, receptor ligand interactions that occur as well that we don't need to worry about. The DC produces cytokines that will further uh, instruct the naive T cell. And if this peptide is foreign, that is, if it's recognized by a T cell receptor, that means it's foreign in most cases, uh, 
Uh, then the T-cell becomes activated and will go on to have effector functions, as we'll talk about in a moment. Now, uh, if the, the peptide is, is, is not recognized by any T-cell, then that's it. Nothing happens. So it's either recognition or nothing. You, you don't, you know, cause so in other words, if the dendritic cell is presenting a self-peptide, some peptide derived from a self-protein, there won't be a T-cell to recognize it. So there will be no activation. There shouldn't be anyway. But we, there are some autoimmune diseases, of course, where the, um, the T cells do recognize some self-peptides because they haven't been eliminated properly during development, and then you have autoimmune diseases. All right, so this is MHC2 mediating this interaction. The uh, MHC2 molecule uh, can be loaded with peptides from the outside of the cell or from the inside of the cell. And so the fancy word we use for the outside is exogenous antigen presentation. So here's where a, say, um, an antigen presenting cell uh, is picking up pieces of dead and dying cells, and among those are proteins. They could be self-proteins, they could be viral proteins. Picks them all up doesn't have any distinguishing. The proteins are taken up by endocytosis. Uh, they move down the endocytic pathway, which, you know, the pH drops uh, of the endosome. Uh, the, um, the, the peptides are degraded, uh, and then they're loaded onto the MHC2 molecule. They're degraded as the, in this case, as the lysosome fuses uh, with the endosome. The lysosome has proteases in it. The MHC2 molecule, in, in turn, is made separately, of course. It is uh, made in the endoplasmic reticulum. It moves through the Golgi, uh, and it, uh, the, these vesicles carry the MHC2. They fuse with the late endosome, so now the MHC2 ends up in the late endosome, and then it can pick up the peptides. And then MHC class 2 moves to the surface in vesicles. It's displayed on the plasma membrane, and there... In the lymph node, which is where the uh, dendritic cell goes, the, the peptide can be presented to a T cell in the context of the T cell receptor. So that's the pathway. And the reason I show you this is that, well, you need to know it. <laughs> and also, uh, there, there are countermeasures here. So uh, human cytomegalovirus can interfere with uh, MHC transcription. And cytomegalovirus will, will infect macrophages. Um, someone asked if dendritic cells can be infected. Uh, yes, they can be infected with certain viruses. And you can imagine that's a problem, right? When, when viruses infect the sentinels, boy, and that's, that's a big problem because they're, the sentinels start everything. They start the adaptive response. And so to have a virus infect them is really, really bad. So HCMV, human cytomegalovirus, actually interferes encodes a protein that interferes with the transcription of the gene for MHC2. So in, in, M, in cytomegalovirus infected cells, MHC2 isn't made. And so why would that be? Of course, the virus is, is interfering with antigen presentation. So MHC never reaches the surface. So this uh, antigen presenting cell cannot display the peptide to the T cell. So you can see, I think, that that is a, a very effective form of countermeasures. So again, continuing the countermeasure theme, there's always a countermeasure. Uh, here in the upper left is a close-up diagram of uh, MHC class 2 with a peptide. There's actually a, a lovely groove at the top um, where the peptide is in. It, it doesn't look like a rectangle, of course. It has been likened to a hot dog in a bun. <laughs> if you look at the top of the MHC2, the st actual structure, which I should really include in this slide. It's so it's so beautiful. Um, next iteration of this course. Uh, it it looks like a hot dog laying in a bun. There's a cl there's a cleft in the top of the MHC, and that's where the, the peptide binds. All right. So that's an exogenous antigen presentation. We're going to get to endogenous in a bit from within. Now, when T cells are activated. In the lymph node, so here's a diagram 
of a lymph node. And, and I am presenting much of this in a very simplified way because I, I want you, this is a virology course. You need to know enough immunology to understand pathogenesis of virus infections. But it's far more complicated than uh, I am presenting it to you. So there are B and T cell zones in the lymph nodes. They're separated. Uh, there are, you can see B cell zones and T cell zones. And then, of course, there there is a a series of lymph vessels. There are uh, lymph vessels that are called afferent that bring in the lymph into the lymph node. And then there are lymph vessels that bring it out, efferent. Uh, there are um, blood vessels supplying this and also nourishing it and, of course, allowing the T and B cells to, to come out. Uh, there are germinal centers where maturation of uh, B cell responses occurs. You have a very extensive uh, um, lymph system, circulatory system in your body. Here's a, a young lady with the um, lymph system sketched. These are all lymph, the major lymph vessels are shown here. Then there's some lymph nodes you can see. And they're, they're throughout your body because um, they have to be pretty near where there's an infection to take care of it. You just have this extensive system. Um, when a, um, okay, so what are the, the numbers are quite interesting. One out of every 10,000 to one out of every 100,000 uh, B or T cells in you recognize some antigen. For, it's foreign. It's not you in a healthy state. And these are B and T cells, it, mainly in lymph nodes and other lymphoid organs like the spleen, but also in circulation and in tissues. They're always moving around. So one in 100,000 will say re recognize a particular epitope of SARS-CoV-2. It's already there in you. It's been made during your early development. And the key is to find those if you're infected, to get one, one of those to interact with the antigen. And so when the T cell is activated by the dendritic cell in a process we've just discussed, uh, within one to two weeks, there's between 1,000 and 50,000-fold amplification of the number of cells. So the, the T cells begin to proliferate much more rapidly to amplify that particular T cell that's re recognizing the peptide, right? And... This is huge. One, one cell goes to 50,000 in a couple of weeks, and not just one, but, it, but all of the uh, cells that are, that are recognizing that. And you, you, know, you wouldn't need to have many, many. Just one is enough, and then you get many cells in time. And this causes swelling of your lymph nodes, which is called lymphadenopathy. And so for some infections, you can feel it. So when you have an upper respiratory tract infection, uh, there are local lymph nodes... Um, uh, at the top of your neck, under your chin, you can feel them. I can feel mine here, but they get much bigger. And that's a, actually a good way to figure out if you have an upper respiratory tract infection. You have swollen lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy. It's Sometimes people can feel them in their armpits uh, when they get a vaccine in the deltoid muscle. Now, of course, there are a lot of lymph nodes that are deep inside of you. You can't feel them swelling, but if you had, say, a GI tract infection, your, your uh, lymph nodes there around the GI tract would be swelling, but you can't feel them, so there's not much you can do. But in certain exposed parts of your body, uh, you can feel the lymph nodes swelling, and that's pretty cool to think, oh, they've encountered an antigen, they're proliferating to make a lot of T cells to perpetuate the uh, adaptive response. This, these cells are in many places. Uh, the the Sentinels and the T and the B cells. So here are two illustrations of the different kinds of uh, immune systems. We have mucosal and cutaneous immune systems. A mucosal immune system we've talked about quite a bit. Well, we've talked about the mucosal tissues, the respiratory tract, the urogenital, the gastrointestinal tract, etc., where there are layers of um, epithelial cells. In this case, this is the intestine but similar situation in the respiratory tract. We have epithelial cells, enterocytes in this case. We have the interspersed M cells, uh, remember, which are very good at pulling antigen from the gut lumen into this, the tissues below. And typically, beneath these M cells, there is a collection of lymphoid cells called a Peyer's patch by the person who discovered it years ago. Peyer's patch. <laughs> 
Um, so it's a collection of lymphoid tissues that are going to sample uh, the antigens. So there would be antigen-presenting cells there, and you can see some of them are diagrammed here, dendritic cells and, and macrophages that are specific for that tissue. Of course, you have blood vessels, you have lymph vessels. So if a uh, an APC picks up an antigen, it can get into the lymph system and go to the local lymph node and present it. And then if there is a foreign peptide, those T cells that are made can come back here to the infected area. The B cells can come back to the infected area. There's also uh, potential to get into the circulation or to come out of the circulation. And so this kind of, uh, this, this kind of um, uh, immune system is called GALT gut associated lymphoid tissue so the pyrus patch is part of the galt if it's in a general term for mucosa associated lymphoid tissue is malt like single malt liquor or malt whatever else whatever else alcohols we were talking about single malts last night how great they are i was in scotland years ago and stayed in a town in the very north called tongue there's a town in scotland called tongue right on the sea, and we stayed at a, uh, at an inn with three or four rooms, but they had a bar, and the guy had so many single malts. We used to go and sample several every night. Um, anyway, malt, sorry to digress. Um, here is an example of the cutaneous immune system. Um, the skin, right? The outer layer uh, of the skin, the very outer layer of the epidermis is dead. Then below it are living cells. And within the epidermis, we have antigen-presenting cells present. Here we have keratinocytes, which is a name for the specific uh, dendritic cell precursor that's found in the skin. It has MHC class two. It has, it can produce cytokines. Uh, then we have uh, Sorry, it's it's a form of antigen-presenting cell. It's got class one and class two. Here is a, a dendritic cell, which has clearly been activated, uh, but they're called Langerhans cells in the skin. And these, when they pick up uh, peptides, can move uh, into the blood, or they can get into well, there there's no. Uh, I guess there are lymph capillaries up here. They could get into it that way as well. So these are just two examples of how. Just about everything in our body has uh, some kind of immune system. And not everything. Some tissues are devoid, uh, appropriately so, because they would be damaged. And we'll talk about that uh, next week. All right, so now it is time to take a break and see um, how you've been uh, listening. We have our first question, which is a property of innate instruction of adaptive immunity. Uh, we have presentation of viral peptides on MHC2 to just look at T cells. Don't be confused by the CD4. Endocytosis of viral proteins. Uh, activation of dendritic cells by cytokines. Sensing by toll-like receptors, all of the above. Innate instruction of adaptive immunity. All right, and then while we're doing that, we'll we'll take some questions here. And so I just wanted to reiterate some. So first of all, um, as we discussed earlier, Microbe TV is now a 501c3, which means your donations at least federal tax deductible in the U.S. Uh, and this will help us raise more money so that I can make a proper entity out of Microbe TV. And it won't just be me and, and the co-hosts, but we'll have people helping us. I have a dream that it becomes a science communication company that exists long after I'm gone. And um, we hire people to do writing, video, make graphics for us. You know, I'd love to make videos with great anim I can't do that, great animation. So this will help us raise significant amounts of money because it is my goal to keep it free for consumers and have people who uh, patron, are patrons to donate and support it. I do think this is a model. We'll see if it works. You don't know unless you try it. All right, now there, were, there, were, there was a question here. Let's see. Mm. And yes, I, I hope 
Brienne has agreed to uh, come on and do a Q&A with me. I don't know when it's going to be. We have to arrange it. But she had originally thought of visiting the incubator and doing one here. But, of course, she doesn't need to come in. We could do it remotely, but we'll work on that. Um, getting to the questions. Someone asked, are there viruses that infect uh, dendritic cells? Yes, as I mentioned, there are. And that can be a problem because it disrupts the uh, antigen presentation, as you saw for monocytes, at least with uh, human cytomegalovirus. Uh, do all animals have T and B cells? So, um, so this is, other people have answered this. Certainly mammals do. Birds have B and B comes from Bursa of Fabricius. That's right. <laughs> First discovered there, right? And someone else answered it. So I'll get to that. Um, would harmless and non-pathogenic viruses typically have no mechanism of defeating our internal... S no, not at all. They actually evade them quite nicely. They don't kill cells, but the immune response does engage, and that causes disease. But we'll talk about that in a, in a separate uh, session for sure. I'm sorry, but just to clarify, no, re no need to be sorry. Is the process of exogenous presentation occurring in a dendritic cell? Yeah. So the dendritic cell, the macrophage, the sentinels, the antigen-presenting cells, right? That's what we call them. They take up antigens, process them, and present them in class 2 by the exogenous pathway. Yes. I remember reading a paper about MHC maintaining uh, humongous allelic diversity uh, because it's involved in sexual selection through olfactory cues. Yes, I, do, I remember that too. So the MHC genes are highly polymorphic. It means they vary extensively, and that gives great uh, resistance to uh, to disease. So out outbred populations. So if you have island populations where there's more, you know, a limited genetic pool, let's say, their MHC are not as variable. They tend to have more disease. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and um, the variability of these receptors also shows, means that if, uh, if you, let's say, this is, this is jumping the gun a bit, but if, you, if you're infected with a virus and it changes a T-cell epitope, um, <clears throat> It's not going to matter for other people because their their MHC and their T cell receptors are, are different. I think we'll get back to that another time. Oh, look, we're, someone is in Tehran today watching. Great, great to have you. Hope you enjoy. Does that mean that the other nine thousand ninety nine would ever recognize or those numbers referring? Those are just to give you an idea for how many cells would recognize a specific peptide. The others are going to recognize something else. Yeah. That's not what I meant by that, just to give you an idea of the frequency. So it's not that low, right? Because you can imagine all of the different amount, numbers of pept potential peptides out there is huge. So you have a lot of these cells in you. So here we go. A jellyfish don't have T and B cells, but most animals, so most animals outside of mammals as well, yeah. The history of the immune system, at least in terms of phylogeny, is fascinating, yep. Uh, this is correct that T cells are activated by sentinels, but not by antigen. T cells are get well. That's my understanding. The, you know, there's always exceptions, but my understanding, and this is how I'm teaching the initial encounter between uh, of antigen with T cells is via the sentinels. Yeah. What does the innate immune system play in cell cultures? Well. So the cells in culture do have innate systems, so they can respond, they can detect uh, viral PAMPs, and they can make cytokines. And um, that's been studied extensively, right? So, and the cytokines, the interferons can induce infer interferon stimulated genes, and they can have antiviral effects, so certain cells in culture. But um, you can remove those genes and see the effect of removing them, for sure. Uh, does there, oh, does there exist any viruses with peptide sequences which T cells do not recognize? Um, 
I'm not aware of it. You've got potentially C cells that'll recognize anything. It's really remarkable. I mean, I could be wrong. That's a great question, but I'm, I'm not aware of any. Uh, oh, so with respect to the 501c3, some companies will match donations of an employee. Yeah, so you should look into that. And, you know, you can give to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com because they're doubling uh, donations through January, but they're only doubling up to 40000 So if they get 20000 in donations, they'll, they'll match it and that's it. I mean, they will accept beyond it. And you can certainly give it to them, but you can also get – and you won't know when we reach it, but – Daniel often says, I can ask him too, um, but then you have the choice of donating either to us or them now. There are potentially endless number of animals. Well, they're not endless, actually. There's a finite number, but there's a big number, yeah. Uh, but we have a lot of cells in us. Yeah, it's amazing. And there's nothing that you don't recognize. It's really remarkable. Is TLR9 and, and lipid rafts co-located? You know, I don't know the answer to that. It, it could be that they're in, in lipid rafts or not. I just don't remember. Yeah. Do pathogenic virus, non-pathogenic viruses activate? Well, they do activate the innate system. But remember, they don't cause inflammation. So you don't have a good adaptive response. So they tend to persist. So B cells take up antigen and also act as antigen-presenting cells. Are there APCs which present antigen to B cells without using... So I don't know, but I, I know that B cells don't need to have antigen. They can have antigen presented, as you'll see in, in, a, in a bit. Um, but they also interact with the, the virus or viral proteins via having antibody on their surface. You'll see that in a moment. Thank you, John, for your contribution. And oh, you like the biology class at MIT? Great. There's good classes there. Could you explain what happens in ADE? We actually will talk about that next week, okay? Uh, what happens, and we, we we'll address it directly for sure. Andrew Weil dreamed of the Center for Integrative Medicine. His dream came alive. It lives in Tucson. Took decades. Well, I've been working on Microbe TV for 12 years, and I'm very patient. And, you know, initially hardly anyone listened. And I said, I'm just going to be patient, slow and steady. And I figure I'm 68. I got 20 years of productive content creation, right? And in those 20 years, I can build a company with other people who can continue it, and I can just make guest appearances or be an advisor. I don't know. We'll see. It's very exciting. I always wanted a second career. Will MHC present cellular peptides? Yes, they will, but there are no T cell that are going to recognize them, at least normally. But as I said, if people who have autoimmune diseases, they do have some T cells that are self-reactive, and that's not good because the process of getting rid of them didn't work. So yes, they, pre they will present. So you, this is constantly happening in you, this presentation. Sentinels are always throughout your body picking up proteins and presenting them, right? Whether you're infected or not. And so they present self, nothing happens. But it's always running, right? It's always a quality control system run running. All right, so let's um, see how we did with the, the quiz here. So everything is a property of innate instruction. Presentation of peptides on MHC2, uh, endocytosis of viral proteins, right? That's the exogenous antigen presentation pathway, activation of dendritic cells, sensing by TLRs. If the, the dendritic cells have TLRs on them, so it's everything. Okay, good. That was 78% uh, of you. <laughs> 
All right, now this is a complicated slide. Here we're going to talk about the eff effectors of the adaptive response. What do I mean by an effector? It's, it's, a, it's the cell that does something uh, to eliminate the virus infection. Um, and so what we've done so far is that a dendritic cell has come in to the lymph node and a peptide it's presented is recognized as foreign by a T cell. Remember, the T cells multiply. So what happens? All right, so now here, let's start in the upper right. In the bone marrow um, is where um, the, both the T and, and B cells uh, mature. In fact, the B cells, all the antibody diversity arises in the bone marrow uh, in early development in your early life. And the T cells uh, are produced there as well, remember, from the stem cell progenitor. Uh, and um, then the T cells move to the thymus where their education is finished, or at least their, pre yeah, their education is finished. They have all the right receptors. And there are two major types of, of T cells. We have T cells with a CD4 molecule on them or T cells with a CD8 molecule. And these are the, the CD4 bearing ones are the helper T cells. This is a precursor of helper. TH means T helper cell. And the CD8s, the CD8 bearing T cells are cytotoxic T lymphocyte precursors. Those are the effector cells. They're both effector cells. The, the TH uh, are going to make cytokines and the CTLs are actually going to kill virus infected cells. All right, so then from the thymus, they go into uh, the lymph node. And these have uh, T cell receptors, you can see here, which will eventually, in the lymph node, engage a peptide on a sentinel. Now, um, when that happens, um, if it's a CD4 cell, and that's typically what ha what's engaging the sentinel first, uh, these begin to proliferate. They make a lot of cytokines. And uh, the, among them are what are called Th1 cytokines, which help the CD8 T cells mature into cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And those will go out of the lymph node into the circulation by the infected area and kill virus-infected cells. And these are the reason why you, if you get vaccinated against COVID, you do not end up in the hospital, you do not die because your T cells will recognize infected cells despite what variant you're infected with. They will kill them and they will resolve the infection. At the same time, the CD4 cells are making cytokines, Th2 cytokines, that help B cells mature into plasma cells, which are the antibody-producing factories, right? They're called plasma cells. They have lots of VR and Golgi because they need to secrete a lot of protein, thousands and thousands of molecules a minute of antibodies. It's just amazing. And so the, the cytokines produced by the CD4 cells also facilitate this, uh, this process right here. Now, in your lymph nodes, you have lots and lots of B cells, just like you have lots and lots of T cells, and they have their own kind of receptor on the surface, uh, the B cell receptor, which is really an antibody molecule stuck in the membrane of the B cell. It's just one specificity. It recognizes one antigen, and if it encounters that antigen, uh, either... Uh, in, in the form of a virus particle if these B cells are circulating around or an antigen that's brought into the lymph node, uh, then they will differentiate into anti antibody-producing uh, plasma cells. Now, th that process is shown a little closer up here uh, on the left. So here is a, a B cell uh, bearing a particular B cell receptor. Um, and the, it, these B cells can recognize antigens uh, by virtue of their antibody molecules that are on the cell surface. When that happens, a signaling transduction pathway ensues uh, that turns on a number of genes that are needed for differentiation into plasma cells. Uh, and you can see here, here is a CD4 uh, T cell, which is actually producing helper cytokines. That was shown in this green line on the right here. But here specifically, you can see this uh, CD4 cell is actually presenting um, is actually recognizing a peptide presented on the surface of the, of the B cell. So the B cell can take up the antigen that is bound to the antibody and display it on MHC2. Uh, that will engage a, a T cell, 
And remember, these have been proliferating as a consequence of the initial instruction by dendritic cells. And so that engagement turns on the synthesis of cytokines that help the B cell mature into a plasma cell. So uh, the, someone asked before if these antigens need to be presented by sentinels. I don't know the answer to that. That is something I should know, but I do not. Uh, what I do know is that certainly the B cells can uh, bind to antigen that is present in an infected individual by virtue of the antibody molecules. And so then we have antibodies produced, and we'll talk about what they do. Uh, and then we have cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and we will talk about what they do as well. All right? So that's the overview. When you talk about antigens, viruses, of course, but bacteria, parasites, fungi, any foreign protein can initiate these kinds of responses. So antibodies first. Let's talk about an antibody molecule. You know, this COVID uh, pandemic has exposed so much misinformation about the immune response. I'm not an immunologist, but boy, let me t I'll try and point out some of the things that are just plain wrong. And I'm sorry, and Amy will, will support this. It's perpetuated by scientists saying the wrong thing, unfortunately. So this is a schematic of an antibody molecule. It is a protein, rather large protein, remember, produced by plasma cells, uh, consisting of four polypeptide chains, two light chains shown in green and two heavy chains shown in red. They're called heavy and light because when they were first discovered, they were, one was smaller than the other. That's it. Uh, and the, uh, the, the very ends of the light and heavy chains, this last domain here, forms the part of the antibody that's going to combine with the antigen. And the rest of the molecule has structural and functional importance. Now, you'll see these, these proteins are drawn um, with these little circles. That is what's called an immunoglobulin-like fold. It's the way the protein folds. And if we had a three-dimensional structure, you could see it a lot better, obviously. So this is just a schematic. There's a, there are disulfide bonds involved in that. That's what the yellow is. Um, and the, uh, immunoglobulin, which is another name for an antibody, uh, is uh, that fold is also present in other proteins, like the poliovirus receptor has four immunoglobulin-like folds. All right, so then we have so ver we have uh, variable regions of uh, light and heavy chains. Then we have constant regions, and it's the variable regions that are produced uh, in the bone marrow by VDJ joining, which I'll show you in a moment, and which are responsible for the diversity of of uh, antigen binding. The top, so the top part of this Y-shaped molecule uh, binds the antigen. That's called FAB because years ago it was found that papain, a protease from papaya, cleaves here. And the top part has uh, antigen binding properties and the bottom part doesn't. The bottom part, though, is called the FC region because it can bind receptors on cells and do important things as well. So papain is an enzyme from papaya. And here in New York City, you can still go to juice bars that will sell you papaya juice with the idea that it's good for digestion, right? And or pineapple juice, which has a protease called bromelain, because pineapples are bromeliads, right? And bromelain is widely used in biochemistry as well as papain. They have different specificities. All right, so that's an antibody. On the right here is an antibody response, a typical antibody response. So we're looking at weeks after injection of antigen A into an animal. Could be a human, could be a mouse, a non-human primate. We're measuring serum antibody titer here on the left. You want me to clarify FAB and FC? This is just two different parts of the antibody produced by papain cleavage, right? A, B, signifying fragment, F stands for fragment, antibody because it binds the antigen, and C uh, is um, the complement binding region. Um, here, back to this, this kinetics, we inject an antigen, and then we measure antibodies in the serum. And you can see uh, in a couple of weeks, and this varies by the animal, by the antigen, um, you start to see an antibody response against antigen A. It peaks and then contracts 
That's the normal thing that happens. It's called contraction. It's not waning. But every damn newspaper in the world is calling it waning because many scientists are calling it waning antibodies after SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. It's ridiculous. Waning suggests something wrong is happening. It is contraction, as Brianne and I discussed on Friday's TWIV. That's the term immunologists use, contraction. Is it too complicated for a reporter to use? Just use contraction, please. Waning makes people think, oh, my vaccine isn't working. I'm waning. It's contraction. It has to contract. You can't have all these antibodies floating around you all the time. So the levels go down to a low but detectable level. They don't disappear. And that's because you have memory. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, if many, many weeks or months or years later, you now inject, let's say, antigen A plus antigen B, two different proteins, you will get a very rapid secondary anti-A response within a few days, as opposed to the weeks that you needed for the primary response. All right? Two, three days. Not immediate. So a virus could come into you against which you've been vaccinated, and yes, it's going to reproduce for a few days until the memory response kicks in. But you're going to be protected against disease. That is how immunity works. You're not going to protect against infection. I'm sorry. And, well, I won't get into it <laughs> another time. You get a very rapid secondary A response. And you can see that we've mixed antigen B, a new antigen, and that's slower which is a primary response is slower. Why is it slower? Because you have to go from that one B cell to many, takes time to do that, and you have to rearrange and get somatic hypermutation, which means D mutations are introduced into the DNA of the antibody molecule to make different versions, and they're selected in the lymph node for higher and higher affinity. So with time, you get a, a really better uh, antibody response as opposed to the initial one. Uh, but the memory of that is stored, and so then if you encounter the antigen again, you can get a very rapid response. Uh, so please remember it's contraction of the antibody response. We'll see the same thing with the T cell response. All right, so now let's do some terminology. Um, an antigen is a molecule that induces an immune response. It can be a protein. It can be DNA. It can be RNA. It could be a lipid. It could be a polysaccharide. Many things induce immune responses. An epitope is not an, uh, it's not an epitope of TWIV, or it can be, epitope 830, but here it's a part of the antigen bound by the antibody or the T-cell receptor. So there are B-cell epitopes bound by antibodies, and there are T-cell epitopes bound by T-cell receptors. So uh, here is a diagram of that, and we, we distinguish generally two kinds of epitope, linear epitopes, 8, 10, 12 amino acids in, in, uh, in, in right next to each other. It's a linear sequence of uh, amino acids that are bound by the variable parts of the antibody, as you can see here. And then we have conformational epitopes where the antibody will bind two uh, sets of amino acid sequences that are, that are distant in the linear sequence. And you can see here um, of, uh, of this particular protein epitope where each circle is, uh, is an amino acid. All right, so linear and conformational epitopes. Uh, a monoclonal antibody is simply an antibody against an, a single epitope, as you see here. Uh, so at, at every antibody that's produced is specific for one particular epitope. And when you have, take serum from someone who has seen an antigen, a foreign antigen, they make antibodies. They make a lot of monoclonal antibodies, which is a mixture. We call that polyclonal. But single amino acids, uh, sorry, single antibodies recognizing single uh, epitopes are, are monoclonal. They're not polyclonal. The polyclonal just refers to the mixture of many, many different uh, antibodies in your blood or serum. Or tissues. Now, let's talk very briefly about how all this B cell receptor diversity is generated. A B cell is another word for the antibody. The B cell receptor is on the surface of B cells, but when the B, B cell becomes a plasma cell, 
and they secrete lots of antibodies, they're soluble. They're no longer linked to the membrane. So in the DNA, in our DNA, uh, in our germline DNA, which means we pass it on to our offspring, we have a, a, a locus uh, uh, which encodes the antibody eventually. It's, it's the gene for the antibody molecules. And in, the, in your bone marrow, in the early days of your life, your bone marrow is producing antibody genes by what is called VDJ recombination. So uh, V and D and J segments are randomly combined by cutting and re-ligating the DNA. So you see first you have a D to J recombination and then V to DJ. There's further uh, diversity produced by transcription, but basically you're mixing up, as Brienne has called it, mixing cards in a deck to produce huge numbers of different antibodies. So the uh, mRNA is produced from this recombined gene, the mRNA pre-mRNA undergoes splicing, and then you get your antibody molecule by translation in the cytoplasm. So VDJ recombination occurs in, in B cells in the bone marrow. So basically, you make all the antibody-bearing B cells uh, ahead of time before you're infected. And what happens after you're infected is a uh, maturation of the affinity of the antibody response in the lymph node by mutation, somatic, what we call somatic hypermutation. So it, many of you may know there was a recent paper published which is causing a lot of um, alarm saying that the spike of SARS-CoV-2 inhibits VDJ recombination in cells and culture in the laboratory. Now, we talked about it yesterday on TWIV, and you should listen to that episode, which hopefully will go up tomorrow. But first of all, these are cells making only spikes, so it's not clear if the same would be found in a virus-infected cell. They didn't look. But more importantly, VDJ recombination happens way before you encounter the pathogen. So spike is not going to have any bearing on it at all. So this is no reason for concern after vaccination or infection. Uh, there are a number of different kinds of antibodies produced, and they're shown here. Uh, we produce IgA, which is, can be found in the serum, as you can see here, but there's also IgA in the mucosal tissues, the mucosa, the, the mucus, and we'll see how it gets there in a moment. Um, we have IgD, which is basically the antibody on the surface of the B cell, what we've called the B cell receptor. So that's called IgE, IgD. IgE is uh, also on epithelial surfaces. It's involved in allergies and, and allergic responses. So we don't talk about that much in this course. Um, IgG is the major antibody for immunity and memory responses. Um, and you can see the concentration in serum is on average 13 milligrams per mil, and the half-life is 25 days. So it has a half-life. It doesn't last forever. That's why the levels contract. It works. And now someone said, why do I say it's not good to have high levels of antibodies? Well, th these antibodies could cause problems if, if you made every antibody that you've ever made to recognize something foreign and kept them at very high levels, you can see that the concentration in the blood would become very high. That would be pathogenic. And it could also lead to uh, autoimmune problems by mechanisms that we don't have time to go into here, but we have discussed on other venues. Uh, then we have IgM, uh, which is also a major antibody. This is the antibody that's made very early after an infection. Before you have done any somatic hypermutation to increase the affinity of the antibody for the antigen. So what's done here is this IgM, there are five copies joined together by a protein. And so it makes up for low affinity by having five copies. So the avidity, we say the avidity of IgM is higher because of this. So IgM is made early and then it declines as IgG with higher affinity is made. And you can see the time course of production of uh, anti these different antibody types here in the graph. This is poliovirus antibody titer. So this is in, uh, say, a non-human primate that's been immunized with poliovirus. We have days after immunization here, and we have green IgG uh, 
I don't know, blue or purple IgM, and then light purple is IgA. So you can see IgM comes up very quickly. And then IgG is also coming up quickly, but IgM is first. It peaks, so you're protected to some extent by this multivalent antibody of low affinity, but then IgG comes up, which is of higher affinity. It's maturing with time. It, its levels peak, and then it contracts, which is not shown here. Um, and then IgA comes up slightly later, and it also contracts, but doesn't reach the same high levels as uh, IgG. So the key here is that we have uh, an early production of IgM, and it's replaced by IgG. So looking at the IgM to IgG can tell you more or less if you are recently infected or if you have just IgG, for example, your infection was probably months ago. Uh, secretory IgA deserves a, a special separate mention because um, it can end up in mucosal tissue. So here's a mucosal epithelial cell, and here's a plasma cell in the subepithelial tissues. These are, of course, the antibody-producing cells. This one is producing IgA. Plasma cells make only one IgA or IgG or IgM. Here, IgA, you can see, is made as a dimer. There are two copies of the antibody linked uh, by, by a, a protein there, J-chain it's called. Uh, and this binds to a receptor on the basal lateral part of the epithelial cell. It's called the polymeric IG receptor, PIGR. It's taken up by endocytosis. And then the vesicles move to the apical domain and the, that re, they fuse with the apical domain. And then the antibody is put on the plasma membrane so it's a transmembrane domain because it's bound to the PIG receptor, and that's cleaved. And then you have the IgA released. It's a dimer with um, the, uh, the receptor still attached to it. So eventually this can be cleaved by, surface, by proteases and uh, release single IgA molecules. In the blood, you can see there are dimeric IgAs in the serum, and then you can have monomeric in the the mucosa. So getting uh, antibody in the mucosal surfaces depends on this uh, process. And IgG can also be transcytosed uh, as well. So explains why you get an intramuscular inoculation and you make antibodies in the blood and they can be transcytosed into the mucosal tissues to protect you against the mucosal respiratory virus infection. Now in the course of the COVID pandemic, many companies have made rapid assays for measuring antibodies in your blood to SARS-CoV-2. So I, I, um, early last year, I, I was sent a, one of these test kits by a company who heard me talking on TWIF. So I had a, a, a SARS-CoV-2 PCR test, I think in February or something like that last year. And it was positive, but the, the CT value was very high. It was 37. So I, didn't, I thought it was a false positive. And I talked about it on TWIV, and I, this company heard me talking about it, so they sent me a at-home antibody test, which I took, and it showed I had no antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. So I, I, it was a false positive. But anyway, there's a video here that talks about how it works. So basically, what you, the kit comes with a, a little needle. You prick your finger. You put a drop of blood on this. You put it in a tube. You mix it with some buffer. You put it in a... They pr give you a little dropper. You put the blood... Uh, on one end of this device, it wicks through it, and then you get bands depending on whether you have, so if you have IgM only, you get one band down here, you, IgG would be here, and then IgG, IgM positive, these two bands. And then there's a control band that tells you how, the, if the assay is working, right? Because if there are no bands, if you're negative, you need to know that the assay worked. And that's shown, the way it works is shown at the left here, which we actually talked about uh, before, but we can go through it again. So you, uh, this is a pad, a absorbent pad with reagents bound to the pad at different places. And you put a drop of your blood here. And if this has antiviral antibodies in it, you can see the antibody molecules there. Um, they, uh, they will move up in the, in the wick, in the pad. And here in this first area, you have some uh, anti, anti rabbit antibodies bound to gold particles, and you also have the antigen uh, bound to the gold particles. 
And so if you have antibodies to the antigen, which in this case would, could be spike of SARS-CoV-2, the antibodies will bind. They will continue to flow. Uh, you have anti-human IgM here first. You have anti-human IgG. And then you have anti-rabbit. So that's the control. So that you have um, these anti-rabbit IgG conjugates are going to move up as well, and they will bind at the, at the final line. That gives you the control line. Uh, and the uh, anti-IgM or IgG will bind your antibodies conjugated to uh, antigen. Uh, and the antigen, the, the gold particle here will, provides the line or one way of providing a line. Uh, they will bind to one or the other. So that's how it works. So that's looking for antibodies. All right, so many antibodies are called neutralizing antibodies. They can block virus infection. And these are essential defenses against many virus infections. They neutralize virus particles, for example, in the blood. They neutralize them in mucus, in tissues. So IgA mucosal surfaces would be important. Or IgG there could do it as well. Uh, and in, in many cases, we think antibodies are important for preventing or at least limiting infection. As I said, unless you have very titers of, of antibodies, uh, you're not likely to protect prevent infection. So why would you have high titers? Well, if you've just been vaccinated, right, or if you've just recovered from infection, you're going to have high titers in your mucosa, in your blood. So you will likely prevent infection. But as your titers contract, you won't prevent infection. And this is what's been observed with SARS-CoV-2. Everybody's freaking out over it that they say, you know, antibodies are waning, but they're not. They're contracting and it's normal. And most Human vaccines don't prevent infection. They prevent disease. And so this has somehow been lost in the narrative around COVID. But the key that I want to make a, a major point of here is that not all of these antibodies that you produce are going to block infection. Right? If you make antibodies against all different parts of a pathogen, some are going to block infection, some won't. But the ones that don't block are actually important as well. But the class that do block infection. They're called neutralizing antibodies, right? Here's an example of a neutralizing antibody assay. We're doing a plaque assay with uh, is a polio virus, say, and here uh, we've made a dilution of virus so that there are going to be about 10 plaques, right? And so uh, you can see here in the bottom the control where we've just mixed the virus with phosphate buffered saline. You, you get the same number of plaques all the time. But on the top we've mixed the virus before make, doing the plaque assay with dilutions of serum. So here is one to 10 dilution. So it's, it's quite concentrated and there are no plaques. One to 100, no plaques. One to 1,000, now you start to get some plaques because you're diluting out the antibodies. And then one to 10,000, you've lost the ability to neutralize. So this is how you can quantify the, the level of neutralizing antibodies in a sample. And so this is a typical assay that's done. It's been done with SARS-CoV-2. Um, over and over and over again. And if you do, if you get a, uh, uh, a, a new, well, most of the antibody tests that you would get at home would not be neutralizing assays. They're just looking for antibodies that are binding. But in laboratories, you can do the neutralizing assay. Now, here's an example of how giving animals antibody protects against disease. This is called passive antibody. It's a, if you take antibody made in one animal and inject it into another. And then you, in this experiment, we have taken non-human primates and um, injected them with poliovirus. Uh, but first we gave them antibodies from another animal against poliovirus. And we've made dilutions of the antibodies here. And so here in the first bar is the control. We're looking at percent paralyzed and these animals were just infected with poliovirus. They're not given any antibody. The antibody could be injected intramuscularly or given intravenously. Uh, so you, all, all of these animals are paralyzed, 100% paralysis. And then if you give a very low dilution of, of antibody, a lot of antibodies, say here, 22, you're protecting them against paralysis. And then if you start to dilute out the, the serum, here, more and more diluted, you get less protection until then you lose all the protection. So the passive administration of, of antibodies is protecting the animals from disease. So in, in many cases, antibodies can 
protect against disease. And in the early days of the COVID pandemic, before we had monoclonal antibodies that could be given to patients, right? So this is a form of the experiment I just told you. We now have multiple monoclonals. These are two made by Lilly. There are ma some made by Regeneron and, and other companies as well. And so each of these vials has a single monoclonal antibody. They can be given in combination. They typically are. Uh, and they're given intravenously. Uh, some other forms of administration have been tried as well. But if that, of course, limits its uh, widespread use. But before we had monoclonals, it took a while to make them, uh, people were using convalescent sera. They would take blood from a recovered COVID patient, uh, and they would produce serum from, from that blood and inject it into people to either prevent infection or to treat them if they were infected. And antibodies don't last, last forever. They have a half-life. They, they, they contract. Their levels contract. And so when you inject people with antibodies within from a month to a year, depending on how the antibody has been produced, uh, they will no longer be protective. And just so you know, serum is what remains in blood after clotting. And plasma, you prevent clotting with an anticoagulant. And you do centrifuge out the cells in both cases. So they're very different. Uh, so now monoclonals have been made. They can be modified in ways to give them a long half-life. And supposedly some can last a year. So if you want to prevent infection, you can get an infusion of those. But it doesn't last as long as vaccination because it's not memory. It's not giving you any memory. Now, the places where the antibodies bind on uh, viruses are called antigenic sites. Uh, in this case, the images I'm showing you are called neutralization antigenic sites because they are the sites to which neutralizing antibodies are binding. And here's poliovirus, for example, uh, where, remember, the caps is made of four different proteins. VP1 is in blue. Uh, VP2 is in green, VP3 is in red, and in white are the places where antibodies bind. So you can see they're distinct places. There's a, a set of binding sites around the five-fold axis, uh, and there's sites around the three-fold axis and the two-fold axis as well. And these can be identified by structure studies and by genetics. Here's the hemagglutinin of influenza virus. Remember the, the, the glycoprotein in the virus particle. Its structure is shown here. The... Uh, Colored sites are epitopes to which uh, neutralizing antibodies bind. There's some on the top of the molecule, and there's some uh, on the stem of the molecule as well. But remember, there are also sites to which antibodies bind, but they don't neutralize infectivity. Here's a lovely picture of poliovirus that I have always uh, very much liked that has um, one monoclonal antibody bound to the particle. So it's saturating levels of the monoclonal, and the site is located around the five-fold axis. So there's the five-fold axis right in the middle. You can see one, two, three, four, five copies of the antibody or binding at each five-fold axis. But, and that's what you would expect from icosahedral symmetry. The sites are going to be repeated 60 times in the virus particle. This has been done as well for SARS-CoV-2 spike. Many studies have shown the structures of monoclonal antibodies bound to the spike. In this case, we're just looking at the FAB. So it's cut with bromelain, or maybe it's just produced as an FAB, and it's bound to the spike, and then the structure is determined. Uh, this, here's the spike in gray with the receptor binding domain shown in red. That's, of course, the part of the spike that attaches to ACE2, the cell receptor. And here is a particular monoclonal antibody. The FAB is in green, the, the uh, variable heavy in light chains. And you can see this is binding to the receptor binding domain. And this particular antibody would, of course, prevent uh, attachment of the spike to the receptor. In general, neutralizing antibodies can work in many ways. Again, the COVID-19 narrative has suggested that they only work by preventing attachment, and certainly many of them do for other viruses. So monoclonal antibodies can bind the virus particle and block their attachment to a cell receptor. Sure, that's absolutely plausible, but there are other modes of neutralization shown here. The antibodies could actually block endocytosis. They can allow attachment, but somehow endocytosis is inhibited. They can allow endocytosis, but block on coding. 
They can even cause aggregation of particles so that they don't get taken up effectively, or they can be taken into the cell and neutralize infectivity after infection has already started. So there are many ways, and don't, I don't want you to think from listening to the COVID story that it's only blocking attachment, which is, in fact, what the majority of antibodies are doing against spike, but um, there's, there are certainly others that are doing other things, and there's some, some that are not neutralizing at all. For example, um, there's a phenomenon called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So we have a virus-infected cell, and this cell is, say, infected with SARS-CoV-2, it's got spike on the surface, right? And you have antibodies in you to spike, which have been made by, say, vaccination. They maybe not neutralizing, but they will bind the spike nonetheless on the surface of this cell. And then an NK cell has receptors on its surface for the FC portion of the antibody. These are FC receptors shown in yellow. They will bind this antibody, and that initiates killing of the cell by the NK cell. So the NK cell recognizes the infected cell by virtue of these antibodies bound to it. It releases these uh, molecules which will induce, in this case, apoptosis, and the infected cell dies. Okay, so I am sure that some antibodies against spike mediate this. Not all of them block attachment. Non-neutralizing antibodies, which is the previous slide showed an example of those, can also um, clear infections in another way. Here's an example where an antibody is bound to a virus particle. So this may not be a neutralizing antibody. It may not block infection. But in this case, the FC portion combined FC receptors on, say, a monocyte or another kind of immune cell. It gets taken up and degraded in the cell. Disease protection by non-neutralizing antibodies. And finally, uh, one newer addition to this, which we talked about in a recent immune. Now, Neutrophils are known to be very important for defense against bacterial infections. And one of the things they do, which is quite interesting, when they sense bacteria, they throw out their DNA. So this is orange DNA with histones on it. And this effectively forms a net that traps the bacteria, and they can be inactivated. So it's called neutrophil extracellular traps, or nets, because this actually looks like a net. Turns out that this is also important uh, for viruses. Um, a paper we did on immune shows that, in fact, virus complex with IgA stimulate the formation uh, of uh, nets from neutrophils. And these are non-neutralizing antibodies. It involves FC receptors on neutrophils. So maybe the um, virus IgA complex is binding to an FC receptor. And the neutrophil responds by throwing out these nets, and the virus gets stuck in the net and um, gets inactivated. So a lot to be learned, and I just want you to understand that it's not all about neutralizing antibody. Viruses, of course, evade antibody responses, just like they evade other parts of the uh, adaptive and innate and intrinsic immune responses. Here are two examples. So uh, rhinovirus exists as over 100 serotypes or genotypes, as we call them now. They have slightly different protein sequences. And so antibodies to one rhinovirus may not bind to another one. And all of these serotypes are circulating at any given time. So it's a form of evasion, antigenic variation. But all the variants are present. Now, influenza is slightly different. It actually undergoes active antigenic variation continuously. Here's the uh, HA of the virus with the antigenic sites shown in colors. One amino acid change at any of these sites can reduce the ability of an antibody to neutralize infectivity. And so this virus changes from year to year. Hey, guess what, folks? Variants emerge that displace previous variants. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. In the case of influenza virus, they're antigenic variants, and they are more fit than previous variants because they evade antibody responses because of reducing the binding of antibodies. And often we have to change the influenza vaccine in order to do that. So that's antigenic variation that happening on a year-to-year -year basis as opposed to, say, for rhinovirus, you know, it, it may change slightly, but mostly the, the evasion is because there are over 100 serotypes always circulating. 
Time for another uh, quiz question. Which statement about antiviral antibodies is wrong, incorrect? They are important for protection against infections. They only neutralize virus infectivity. They may block virus attachment to cells. They can be found at mucosal surfaces. IgM is the first to appear, then IgG. All right, let's take a look at some questions. Let me take this very last one here because it, how, how many of the hundred would, would a typical middle-aged human have memory to? So let's say you get one a year, 50, right? So by, even when you're older, you're not going to have immunity to all of them. So that's why you just keep getting rhinovirus infections all of your life because you can never have immunity to all of them. And maybe that's why we don't have a, a vaccine. You'd have to make a many, many serotype vaccine unless you could find a common epitope, which would be another approach as well. Um, um, okay. So, so Mr. Ozikam has elaborated on the immune strategies, the, the variable lymphocyte receptor-based system in jawless organisms and the uh, B cell receptor, T cell receptor system in jawed vertebrates. That's right. Very, very interesting difference. Hey, Brazil. Hello. I've been to Brazil twice. <laughs> Many friends there. What does the plus sign mean? <coughs> Excuse me. The plus sign just means that it has CD4. CD4 positive means these cells have CD4. Are there viruses that target CD4? Well, yeah, there's HIV, which infects CD4 T cells and totally messes them up. And so you don't get good adaptive responses to any antigen, not just HIV. So people with AIDS, if they're not treated, they die of opportunistic infections because your immune system can't handle it. Yep, Orange Julius is the one here in New York City that sells. It's still there, I think. We had this discussion on TWIV. Some people sent me pictures of it. The size of antigens was asked and someone answered it. Uh, so this is a good question. The B cell receptor can evolve with time. <clears throat> it can, actually. And you can actually make antibodies by that random VDJ that will recognize all variants. And those are the ones that are expanded in people who are infected and vaccinated. Because you have those. It's just a matter of expanding them. And I think putting the two vaccine doses so close together was a problem. It prevented that. So that's one of the justifications for the boost. Maybe you... You know, you're six months out, you get a boost. Maybe now you're going to amplify all those variant-recognizing antibodies, which may be rarer. We'll see if that happens. If that happens, then I'll get a boost. Yeah, so <clears throat> somatic re recombination and hypermutation was a big surprise. So somatic recombination was discovered by Susumu Tonagawa, got the Nobel Prize for that, and that was one of my picks on a recent TWIV of seminal discoveries. Hypermutation later found and the enzyme uh, that, that's responsible. Yeah, very surprising, but very interesting. Okay, do B cells need to bind both antigen? So there are some T helper independent antigens. So it depends on the antigen. But um, for many antigens, you need T cell help. Yep. IgM is a primary response. You, you, later, you have IgG memory, so you don't need to make IgM. <clears throat> but I do think you might make some, but I, I don't think, I think it's swamped by IgG. Medical doctors give apples every day. Yeah, yeah but I think it's, you can measure, you can remember it. IgM is the low affinity. It's made first. And then IgG. Uh, and then A and E are easy, but that's fine. <clears throat> So avidity is uh, how well something binds based on multiple affinities. So affinity is the interaction between 
one antibody and its epitope. Avidity is the sum of, of those affinities when you have multiple uh, molecules binding, multiple antibodies binding, okay? So it doesn't make sense for one, but avidity makes sense for when you have more than one interaction. <clears throat> Do we know the minimum dose of SARS-CoV-2 that can lead to disease? No, <clears throat> we don't, but there are challenge studies in the UK that may address that. And people are putting paper titles with waning in them. You're doing it just to bug me, right? But as I said, it's not should be contraction of the immune response, should not be waning. But I've lost that battle years ago, months ago. How does the antibody test differentiate infection and vaccination? So you look for antibodies <clears throat> to a protein that is not in the vaccine. So the vaccines mostly have spike. So if you look for spike, you're not going to differentiate between infection and immunity. So many uh, antibody tests will look for spike and nucleocapsid protein, N protein. And then if you have spike only, you've been vaccinated but not infected. If you have spike and N, you have been infected. Could an antibody be neutral, non-neutralizing in the lab, but neutralizing in an animal? <clears throat> no, so, I mean, neutralization is defined in the lab, right? You do a neutralization assay in cell culture. So if it's neutralizing in the lab, it's, it's likely to be neutralizing in an animal. If it's not neutralizing in the lab, I don't see how it could neutralize in an animal. But it can protect against infection by the mechanisms that we talked about. Are the pharmaceutical products ending in MAB? Yes, that's supposed to be the monoclonal designation. Tocilizumab would be a monoclonal. That's right. <laughs> what about a poison? Can T cells, if the poison is a, a antigenic, yeah, it could be a protein poison or some other type, it would be recognized as foreign, sure. Yep. Is antigenic variation the same as genetic shift drift? Yes, so genetic shift and drift can lead to antigenic variation, and we'll actually talk about that more subsequently. 100 serotypes of rhino, why isn't there a dominant variant? Every year, so there isn't a dominant variant of flu. Well, there is every year, but it can change, right? <clears throat> why isn't there for rhino? I don't know, it's a good question. They're probably all equally fit, and they don't outcompete each other, yeah. Generation of B-cell receptor, the Brienne said, variation is like 10 to the 630 variant. Yeah, it's amazing. That's why you can cover everything. Yep. Could one monoclonal act on different types of viruses? Well, it depends what you mean by different, like influenza versus coronavirus. Pro I mean, it's possible that there'd be a, a shared epitope. Um, more likely within the coronas, though. You could certainly see that happening. No, plants do not have immune systems like animals. No, they don't make antibodies. They do have uh, RNA-based immunity, though. If, if uh, current vaccines target both B and T cell response, why wouldn't we target nucleocapsid? Yeah, N is the most uh, abundant protein. Oh, I think we should. They have T cell epitopes. So I don't know how antibodies to nucleocapsid would block infection, right? I'm not sure. I mean, they could act by the antibodies getting in a cell and doing something intracellularly, I suppose. It hasn't been shown, but it's possible. But you would certainly have a lot of T cell epitopes to N. And I, it's too bad we didn't have N in the vaccines either. I agree. I'm not sure what, if it would have made a difference, but we don't know. Yeah, you could mix and match mRNAs. <clears throat> 
I wouldn't take small doses of a poison, but you can modify the poison to vaccinate you. Like diphtheria toxin can be vaccinated, can be modified so it doesn't kill you and inject it, and then you make antibodies against it. Yep. Okay, let's go back to uh, quiz. Uh, it's number B. They only neutralize infectivity, right? Antibodies do other things as well, besides neutralizing infectivity. I hope you got that. Cell-mediated immunity is essential for clearing virus infections. <clears throat> and preventing disease. And what happens is the cytotoxic T lymphocyte, the CD8 positive T cell, which has been amplified by you know, recognition of a foreign epitope, it forms a synapse between the virus infected cell and it kills it. The T cell receptor recognizes a peptide in the virus infected cell presented in MHC1, not 2. And then the CD8 cell releases uh, proteins that make holes in the membrane and a protein called granzyme goes in and it causes apoptosis. And of course, viruses have countermeasures for this. And this involves the endogenous antigen presentation step. So here we have a virus infected cell, right? This is not an antigen presenting cell, it's a virus infected cell. Uh, and then we have, uh, it's infected with the virus, so it's making viral proteins and some of those are digested by the proteasome into peptides. The peptides are transported into the ER by a transporter T TAP, one and two, is a transporter for peptides, transporter associated with antigen processing. I can't remember the names either. That's why I have to write them here. In the ER, they're loaded into MHC1. MHC1 goes to the surface, and then it presents the peptide to a CTL. And if the CTL recognizes it, it'll kill this cell. So the cell, infected cell, is doing this, independent of virus infection. But of course, virus infections can counteract this pathway for sure. And these red circles show the different points of counteraction, mainly in herpes viruses that cause long-term infections. They need to counter this. They don't need, they don't, um, they, they want, they, they prevent infected cells from being lysed. So some viral proteins can inhibit the proteasome. Some can inhibit transport of the peptides, loading onto MHC, even MHC, uh, present, presence in the ER. And some uh, viral proteins can actually downregulate the cell surface MHC and get it degraded so it's not present on the cell. So an, an invisible cell can't be lysed. And the, um, the peptide is shown here uh, in, the mo in the MHC model is a groove at the top, which is actually shown here. This is a hot dog in a hot dog bun. There's the peptide in blue, and that's MHC1 nestling it. There's no mustard on that, but it's still a very good <laughs> display of the peptide. And that's how the CTL um, kills the virus-infected cell. Of course, we counter MHC. There are viral proteins that counter the synthesis of MHC1. There are viral proteins that inhibit TAP synthesis and TAP function, the transporter. There are viral proteins that inhibit MHC1 transport. There's some that cause it to be retained in the ER, never get to the cell surface. And as I said, some of them downregulate it from the cell surface. Here's how lysis works. Uh, the CTL recognizes the infected cell. It releases uh, proteins, two kinds of proteins. One is called uh, perforin, the purple one, which forms a pore in the cell membrane and things leak out and eventually the cell will die. But then it also ex exudes granzyme B, the red dots. That's a protein that goes through the pore, and it triggers apoptosis by cleaving uh, procaspases to caspases that are involved in uh, initiation of apoptosis. That's programmed cell death, so the cells die. So um, these CTLs, uh, lice virus-infected cells, by recognizing peptide on the cell surface. So here's an experiment that Ask the question, what's important in protecting against monkeypox disease? Not infection, disease. So what we do here is we have animals that are going to be infected with monkeypox, which would normally kill them. And we first take three groups. We have uh, a control group where we immunize them with uh, the virus first. And then we measure neutralizing antibody in the blood at day 22. You can see the neutralization titers are high. We infect them 
and they're all protected. Nobody dies. Now, this, this group of monkeys, we deplete B cells before immunization. Their antibody titers are low, of course. There are no B cells to produce antibodies. We challenge them. They, three out of four die. So this tells you that B cells are important uh, for protection against disease. Uh, and then we can deplete CD8 cells. Antibody titers are not affected uh, because these are CD8s, not CD4s, and no fatality here. So in this case, the disease is prevented by the presence of high levels of antibodies. But of course, if these contract, uh, then most likely the T cells would take up the slack. Now, depending on the um, virus, sometimes the CTL response is, is more important than the antibody response or vice versa. It's a balance of the two. How do you make the right response? Well, it really begins in lymph tissues where the sentinels interact with B and T cells. And that interaction sets the stage for what kind of response a cellular or an antibody or a mix is going to be made. So the helper cells are important for that. These cells, remember, the T cells, the TH cells are the ones that are contacting the sentinel cells and looking at the uh, antigen. Uh, and that kind of peptide and the, and the information exchange, the cytokines, determine whether the uh, TH cell differentiates, in this case, into TH1 or TH2 or other kinds as well. There are, there are a number of different kinds of T helper cells. So you start with a naive CD4 T cells. It encounters antigen. It can become different kinds of helper cells. Uh, there are some involved in tumor immunity, TH17s. There are T regulatory cells that dampen the immune response because you don't want it to go crazy out of control. Uh, and then we have TH1 cells, the differentiation of CD4 into TH1. Uh, that's caused by, in particular, IL-12 production. Um, and these TH1s provide help for CTLs to differentiate CD8s into CTLs, whereas the TH2 uh, are the ones that are involved in providing antibody help. And so the, the kinds of cytokines that are produced after the peptide recognition by this naive cell determines uh, where this is going to go. So, for example, here's a virus that is um, being sensed by a sentinel, and that sensing leads to the production of IL-12, uh, which in this case favors a TH1 response, right? IL-12 favors a TH1 response, and that's going, that kind of CD4 cell, TH1 CD4, is going to make cytotoxic T lymphocytes, whereas if it were a TH2 response, you would favor the production of antibodies. But typically, there's a balance uh, between the two. Our last question for today. Uh, for some infections, CTLs are more important for protection than antibody. How is the CTL antibody balance determined? By toll-like receptors, by intrinsic defenses, by autophagy of infected cells, by the mix of peptides and cytokines presented by DCs. It depends on whether the capsid is icosahedral or helical. Let's see, where was our last question? When the immune system helps prevent slow cancer growth or cancer cells being seen and treated as far. So there's a whole cancer surveillance part of the immune system um, where, in fact, cancer cells can display unusual antigens because they are reproducing in constantly and they're mutating the sequences of genes and so they're different proteins that are not looked at as self. They're neoantigens, and so they can be recognized and eliminated. But often, uh, the, the growth of cancers out, outpaces the immune response, and the immune response gets exhausted. There's a thing called T-cell exhaustion. And that can be overcome by checkpoint therapy, and that's why that's been, in part, so successful. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's a whole other area, very infection. Yep, anti-venoms are purified antibodies against venoms or venom components. That's right. Uh, 2C is a monoclonal, but to us, not an epitope. It's a, well, it's a monoclonal to IL... It's either to the IL-6 or the receptor. But tocilizumab is a... We, we were uh, saying that in, in terms of nomenclature of drugs. If they have a MAB at the end of the drug... Uh, 
uh, it is a monoclonal antibody therapy. And you can treat the, the virus or you can treat the immune response. That's right. If a wide range of rhinoviruses do not become dominant, does this mean each has become optimized? I would say they're each equally fit, right? And there's no competition between them. I think that's correct. Yes, we, we, we are, I don't think we have any confusion that the Regeneron monoclonals are against SARS-CoV-2 and TOSI and others are against host proteins like IL-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Okay, let's get back to quiz. What's the answer? Mix of peptides and cytokines. Most of you got that, I guess, because it was just <laughs> the previous slide, right? That's good. Now, the final aspect, adaptive responses provide memory. What does that mean? Well, if you're infected with the same virus or a similar virus, the response is rapid and specific. Innate responses don't have memory, right? And memory is the basis for vaccination. We, we learned that infection provides memory uh, many years ago. An a, a epidemiologist was studying measles on the Faroe Islands, north of the United Kingdom here. Uh, and, um, you know, at the time in 1700s, it was uh, quite isolated and ships visited ra rather rarely. There was an outbreak of measles in 1781. For the next 65 years, no measles on the island. Uh, in 1846, there was another outbreak. Presumably a ship arrived and brought in the virus. But nobody who survived the 81 epidemic were infected. You know, the people infected were those that hadn't been infected initially. So immune memory lasts a long time, and it's maintained without re-exposure to virus, although re-exposure can boost it. You know, so especially if immunity doesn't prevent infection, which is, is likely the case because the memory response takes a couple of days, right? You're probably getting little boosts all the time and you don't know it. You don't get sick because the antibody response ramps in. It, it tamps down viral loads. C -tel, T cell responses keep kill infected cells. But you're probably getting little boosts, but you don't need it. That's the point of this experiment. And here again is our slide showing immunological memory. You have your first exposure. You take a while to make an antibody T cell response that then contracts to some low level. And then at a subsequent exposure, you have a rapid response in the, in the form of B and T cells. Not immediate, but rapid. And therefore, you can uh, control the, the disease. You get, may get a mild infection you may even get an inapparent infection or mild, as you can see here in this from the textbook that was published ages ago. Uh, and so the immune response contracts because that's the physiological level that you don't need to have high levels of antibodies and it would probably be pathological. What controls or maintains immune memory? Well, we have memory B cells. So after the uh, initial expansion of uh, of your B cells into plasma cells. A fraction of them become memory cells, which are located in the spleen and other lymphoid organs, the lymph nodes. They're not making antibodies, but all the, you know, they have the VDJ rearrangement that is specific for the antigen. And they, they most likely are high affinity antibody producing cells because they've gone through rounds of uh, somatic hypermutation in, in the lymph nodes and selection for high affinity antibodies. And so that is stored as a memory B cell. So you don't have to go through all of that again. And when they are stimulated by antigen, when antigen comes to a mucosal surface, there's some B cells below it that can respond to the antigen. They will interact with it and they will start to produce, they will become plasma cells and they will secrete antibodies. So that's a memory B cell. Uh, we also have long-lived plasma cells uh, in the bone marrow particularly they're not making antibodies, but they can be stimulated uh, to produce antibodies. And uh, they may also produce the low levels of antibodies that you can detect in um, serum of people who have been vaccinated or survive an infection. Then there are memory T cells as well. 
So the, the uh, persistence of antibody has been studied in humans for uh, a number of, of, of viruses, as you can see here. Here we have a number of viruses that cause systemic infections. In other words, they enter somewhere and they spread throughout the body. That's a systemic infection. And look at these. This is how long antibody can be detected in people. Look at these numbers. And now, this doesn't mean they're high levels. They're very, very low, but they're not zero. Uh, 75 years for vaccinia virus. It's amazing. And so, this, for, in many cases, the vaccines could last this long as well in terms of memory, memory B cells, because that's what we're looking at here, antibody. But interestingly, mucosal infections don't um, lead to persistence of antibody for as long. Look at this, 12 months, 30 months, three months, 12 months. So for some reason, you know, an infection that's limited to a mucosal surface doesn't produce the long-lasting antibody. I'm, I'm guessing that in these cases, the memory cells are gone. So it's not necess necessarily a correct assumption to say that memory cells will last forever. They may go away. Um, and, and what controls that, we don't know. Now, for influenza virus, at least in mice, uh, if you don't add an adjuvant, you don't make memory cells. Uh, they, and so the nature of the antigen is clearly important, but also where it's in the body. is So having a systemic infection is clearly better. Uh, T cell memory also is a thing that contracts. So here you have a days post-infection, right? And, and, you know, we see an expansion of different kinds of T cells, right? From our naive T cell, which originally will recognize the peptide antigen in the lymph node, it expands, but it just, it becomes a number of different kinds of cells, right? It becomes uh, effector cells, which could be the CD4s or the, the CD4s that are making cytokines or the CD8s that are CTLs that are killing virus-infected cells. But you also make, and those are called terminal effector cells. They're the majority population. They eventually contract at some point because you no longer need them, right? The infection is over. You don't need CD4s or 8s. But you do make memory cells, and they're different kinds of memory cells. They're shown in different colors here, uh, and they last a long time. So you have some circulating types, uh, you have what are called effector memory cells, or TEMs. They, these are found in the circulation. Uh, you have central memory cells, which are found in your lymphoid organs, so they're poised to go out if they need to. Uh, and then there are non-circulating memory cells. Uh, these are called resident memories, or TRMs, and those are typically found in the organ that was infected. So if you had a lung infection with influenza virus, you can find TRMs in the lung. So these are memory. They have memory of the antigen, and they're poised to expand again on a subsequent infection. So their levels contract. And in the case of the effectors, they go away. You don't need them anymore. But the memories, all the different kinds of memory cells are still present, uh, and those are poised to return when the, if you uh, encounter the pathogen uh, again. So all of this um, adaptive response is really coordinated with the innate response by inflammation. I told you this before, and I just want to emphasize it. Inflammation provides integration and synergy with uh, the immune system. So we have, remember, our uh, cells are infected. They, they're sensed. They produce chemokines and cytokines that attract cells and cause the inflammation, the swelling, the redness, the pain, the heat. Uh, and that inflammation activates the adaptive system. But viruses that induce more inflammation or induce better adaptive responses. And there are some that are not cytopathic. They don't induce a good adaptive response, and they, 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 there is a lot of trouble clearing them. And when we talk about vaccines, we'll get to the uh, implications of that as well. So for next week, we will start on Monday uh, to talk about mechanisms of pathogenesis. Now you have a good understanding of immune responses to infection. It's rudimentary, right? But it's, it is good enough to understand now how viruses cause disease. So that is what uh, Monday's session is going to be about. <clears throat> Has anyone asked about the Swedish in vitro study showing spike? Well, you didn't have to ask because I talked about it <clears throat> 
Uh, so I have two things to tell you. First, you could listen to TWIV's 830, which is dropping tomorrow. When we talked about the paper. But the bottom line is, there's a slide earlier here that says the VDJ recombination, which is said to be inhibited in cells uh, in culture when you add spike, that happens before you see the pathogen. So there's no way that that, has, that observation has any impact on immunization or infection. All those antibodies are in you already. Th their generation doesn't depend on the presence of the pathogen. Now, the study doesn't have to be reproduced at all because there's no way this could have any effect on antibody generation because VDJ recombination occurs before you get infected or vaccinated. And it's another question on that one. <laughs> Oh, so the plasma cells probably don't last. I don't know the number, how long long-lived plasma cells last, but my understanding is they turn over. Um, they don't last forever, and they can divide and provide new ones. And there's a question about vaccines, which we can talk about when we discuss vaccines. Will vaccines boosters be needed? Well, th that's a good question because I showed you evidence that for respiratory viruses, immunity, antibodies at least in the blood, don't last a long time. So we don't know. Um, I think the current evidence, well, the T cells are going to last a long time. I didn't show you data on that, but uh, I suspect the T cells are going to last a long time, either induced by infection or vaccination, and those are what protect you against severe disease and death. The antibody levels are probably, the memory levels are probably going to decline, but I'm not sure when. Now, it could be that the kinds of vaccines we're using uh, get around that. It's really an interesting question, and we don't know yet. Can we say all respiratory viruses have short-lived vaccines? Well, I don't think you can ever generalize to all viruses. What I showed you is that antibodies to respire, certain respiratory virus infections uh, seem to go uh, be undetectable after a certain number of years. And as I said, whether that's true for SARS-CoV-2, we just don't know. Has it been shown that people who had first SARS still have T cells 17 years later? That's absolutely right. T cells, the, the memory T cells, 17 years at least. So I think you can assume that SARS-CoV-2, you're going to see memory T cells at least that long. Do you have a doppelganger that puts on a plant virus podcast? I don't, but there are plant podcasts, as you know, but no plant viruses. I'm, I'd be happy to start one here at the incubator with a suitable plant virologist. Or we could just bring one onto TWIV now and then. But yeah, I'd like to do that. I think that would be great. Do recipients of bone marrow or blood transfusions... Uh, receive any of the donor's immune cells. So um, in, in the bone marrow, you're typically giving uh, stem cells. So that's before any of the, the differentiation has occurred. And you can get those from the blood now quite readily. Yes, if you give blood, if you give whole blood, yes, you're getting immune cells as well. But those are going to be short-lived. They're, they're not going to uh, last forever. Uh, the antibodies for mucosal infections from the table, they're measured in the blood, right? Could they be present in mucosal? So the mucosal antibodies decline even quicker. So those contract w within months. So mucosal antibody levels are, are, are very low. And the idea being that they can be replenished, I suppose, by B cell, local B cells or from the serum. But um, that's part of the reason why it's hard to protect against the mucosal pathogen against infection unless you have high levels which would only happen right after vaccination or recovery. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution. The text actually uses the term mind-boggling. Yes, I'm sure that was Glenn Rawls doing. 
he's the guy who would have that kind of language. The other, uh, the others are of us are probably too staid to do that, but I think it's good. One of your previous guests said we get influenza approximately every ten years, but antibodies disappear, disappear after thirty months. No, we don't. We get. I'm not sure if that's correct. We you get influenza infections yearly, and you have to be immunized yearly because the memory isn't very good using our current influenza vaccines, right? And that's the problem. We got to. We have to make that better. Doesn't IM vaccination cause a systemic rather than mucosal infection? That's correct. So maybe that's mitigating the, the longevity. I mean, it, it doesn't cause a systemic infection. And so that may be the key. It may not be good enough just to in, inoculate a vaccine intramuscularly. Um, oh, so for virus, for vaccines that are infectious, Certainly, there's long-lived antibody in the in the blood. So measles vaccine, for example, it's a mucosal pathogen, but it causes a systemic infection. The vaccine is infectious. So I think if you have an infectious vaccine, then you get that long-lived antibody. But if you're just injecting IM, you know, it's mostly being processed in, in the local lymph nodes. So I'm not sure that's going to give you long uh, antibody in the blood. We'll see, right? We're going to have to do the study. Thank you, Kate, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Is it true that measles infection can erase all previous memory cells? Yes. We're going to talk about that when we talk about acute infections. That includes measles. But yes, it, uh, it, it reproduces in and kills memory B cells. It erases your immune memory. That's why people need to get vaccinated against measles. Thank you, Marge716, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Israel. Really appreciate your contribution and support. Innate defense does not have memory. What about CRISPR? CRISPR is intrinsic, right? It's always present. The problem with the Swedish thing is not just VDJ, yes. The problem is it's cells and culture and, and it's just spike and you don't know if that happens in infection as well. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of issues. Listen to the TWIV. Thank you, Barb Mack, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. So the uh, measles wiping B-cell memory, um, it will return, but, you know, if someone is 15 and they get measles and they've already had all their vaccines, you're going to have to get them again. If you've been infected with a variety of viruses, you're going to have to get them again to restore your, your memory. Okay. So it's not permanent, but it, it is a problem, right? Because you have to go through all the vaccinations and infections again. This is the paper I was referring to where CRISPR might be favoring cancer cells. It's a systematic genome-wide mapping of oncogenic mutation selection during CRISPR-Cas genome editing. I haven't seen it. I have to take a look at it. It does sound interesting. We should not make conclusions about in vivo from in vitro vero. Yes, I agree. Um, and first thing you have to do is infect cells. But I just am not sure if this is a if this virus is killing cells, right? What's going to be the effect of inhibiting any kind of DNA recombination, whether it's homologous or non-homologous? I mean, if this were persistently infecting cells, it might be an issue, but I don't know of any evidence for that. And we don't even know that the virus infects the B cell progenitors where this would be an issue. So yeah, there are a lot of problems with that study. Was that known about measles 
back in the 60s. No, it was just in the last couple of years. In fact, it was we talked, the, the people who did that included Michael Minna, and he was on Immune a couple of years ago to discuss those, those findings. It was a really good, it was the first time we encountered Michael Minna. It was a good episode. Have you ever had Harold Zerhausen on TWIV? Uh, I interviewed him once. You can find an interview of me with him. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, let me end this quiz here. Finish. Rakaniello Zurhausen. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I'm going to put the link in the chat so you can find my... It was an interesting interview with Harold. Interesting guy. I was actually scared because he was kind of a impressive fellow, but he was nice. He was very nice. <laughs> uh, I don't know if measles is the only virus that does that. It's the only one that's been looked at. Yeah. So here's the link to my interview with Harold Zurhausen. It was done in Manchester, England um, for at an ASM meeting. That was 2013. And boy, look at the picture. He looked a little serious, but he was very nice. As someone said in the comments, he was quite gracious. Yes, it was quite nice. All right, folks, I want to thank the uh, moderators. Here, let me show you the picture of him. Hold on. There it is. It's Harold. Serious, though, but he was really cool in the interview. All right, folks, thanks to the, in to the moderators uh, for helping again today. Really appreciate your help in keeping the atmosphere civil. Thanks, everybody, for coming, for having a great chat, and for uh, asking good questions. And uh, we'll be back on Monday. Uh, and don't forget, tomorrow, Thursday, at 8 p.m. Eastern U.S., we'll have Q&A with A&V. Amy, you'll come here in the studio to do that. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, be safe and uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye.